Hey there, Calc folks, back here with a, uh, another video in our study of vector-valued functions where uh, we are studying motion in n-dimensional space. And what we want to continue with is our uh, study of using future value and that calculation for future value in our analysis of motion. And then take that over into uh, an analysis of projectile motion, folks. All right. So um, we'll jump into it because we got quite a set of notes here today. I wish it was shorter, uh, but this topic, uh, well, I, I approached it with as much brevity as I could and got uh, several examples in there at the same time. So. Bear with me here, folks. We'll get through it as quick as we can. Just a couple of examples. Nothing really new. All of the uh, ideas we've used uh, come from the, that those ideas from fu for, for the future value function uh, presented back in the notes for net value and future value. Uh, go back and watch that video. Right, That's what we're going to rely on here. Uh, but what we're going to be focusing in on, like I said, is, is, is really looking at an analysis of uh, motion in space uh, particularly the, the, the cases of looking at developing velocity from acceleration and developing uh, position from velocity information, right? And then a little later on here, looking at um, all of this developing into projectile motion problems. All right. So uh, we'll take note here. Um, that's the idea that we are going to be seeing here. You can take note there. But let's look at our first problem here. Uh, for example, consider finding the description of the object's position in three-dimensional space uh, given the following description of its velocity. Right? We might be told the velocity of the object is described by the three-dimensional vector t comma 2 t comma square root of t. And we may be told um, that the position of the object at time t equal to 4 is described by the three-dimensional vector 2 comma 1 comma negative 1. All right? To go about finding the description of the object's position, to go about finding the actual description of our bar of t, right, that has these two characteristics, right, we rely on a little future value calculation. All right? From the case of future value, uh, this position function will be given by r bar of t, the function that, that is the function we're seeking and obtaining that from velocity. And that is going to be equal to r bar of 4. It is going to be uh, the observed value of position added to the integral, right? The What we might think of as the net value calculation of the integral uh, starting at 4 and continuing up to t for what would be the rate of change in the position function, uh, what we understand is the velocity uh, function, uh, ve the velocity vector valued function, uh, written or expressed in terms of u. Where here, we know what r bar of 4 is, that is 2 comma 1 comma negative 1, and we know what v bar of t is, so in terms of u, we replace all those t's with u, and we get u comma 2u comma square root of u, and integrating that all with respect to u, and integrating that across the bounds from 4 to t. Keep in mind, u is coming in as a dummy variable, kind of as a placeholder, uh, and t is going to return itself to the functional form that we're building here as the independent variable. Leaving t in here would just cause for confusion, folks, uh, especially when thinking about having to integrate across the bound of t. All right? So that's why we make use of that dummy variable, u. You can see it makes a dummy out of me every now and again when I forget to use it in a setup. All right? So if we evaluate that antiderivative, uh, the little fundamental rules, u is 1 half u squared, 2u. Bump it up to 2, divide by 2 is just u squared. And then square root of u is u to the 1 half, so that becomes u to the 3 halves. Divide by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. And u to the 3 halves, I like to simplify that into u square root of u. If you had u to the 5 halves, that would be u squared square root of u. 
right? And so forth. Uh, that's kind of a unique way of thinking about it where evaluation is not so tricky, right? Uh, so it is our vector, r bar of four, added to the antiderivative of our uh, v bar of u, evaluated at t, which we give here, minus the value of this at 4. And if I substitute in 4, that does produce the vectors 8, 16, and 16 thirds. All right? Where if I add together these results and subtract this difference, all right, this is the result of those vector operations. All right? And thus, this would be our description of velocity, or sorry, thus, thus for the description of velocity, uh, this would be the corresponding uh, description of position. The description of position where at time t equal to 4, uh, we fit that location 2, comma 1, comma negative 1 in value. Right? This description of position that when we take the derivative of our position function, it yields v bar of t, the rate of change in this position that we were given. All right? This is what's known as sometimes an initial value problem. Uh, this is what I refer to as a future value problem. I don't always look at this, the initial value case. What I incorporate is actually a future value in it, uh, into the situation. All right. Uh, now, future value problems can um, develop into projectile motion problems. So I follow up here with a projectile motion problem uh, where we consider the motion of a projectile subject only to the pull of gravity and that is a classical projectile motion problem if you uh, start to think about uh, a projectile and its behavior uh, being subject to other factors like wind resistance or uh, aerodynamics of some kind um, you're falling out of that classical interpretation of projectile motion right uh, projectile motion is a motion through space whose acceleration is due or whose acceleration changes are only due to the pull of gravity, right? Uh, there's nothing else influencing the acceleration or oh, the acceleration of the object, right? And when thinking about the topic of gravity, uh, what we keep in mind here is that gravity pulls at a constant rate, right? And we can generalize that in our problems by just using little g. This is sometimes referred to as the gravitational constant. All right, little g is our gravitational constant. Where on Earth, um, little g, if we were to give our measurement in uh, meters per second squared, it would be 9.8 meters per second squared. Again, it's a measure of acceleration. So it is a measure of a distance per unit of time squared. Right? It is describing a change in velocity with respect to time. And that's where the, the squared unit of time comes from. Or in terms of feet, it would be 32 feet per second squared. Right? Where in any generic case of projectile motion for any generic gravitational system, uh, we could say three-dimensionally, uh, consider the three-dimensional scenario here in our setup. Um, that would always be described by this three-dimensional vector, 0, 0, negative g. Gravity always pulls towards, or we might say here gravity sucks, right? It sucks things towards it, right, in its uh, behavior. And, it, and it, it does that with a constant pull, right, of force, right? Constant, ex causing a constant change in acceleration, right? Um, so... If we go on and further observe uh, velocity and position for a projectile, right? The corresponding velocity and position functions could be determined uh, using these observations. And again, this would be done using a future value calculation as we had done in the previous example, but now specific to projectile motion. All right. For example, Assume we have observed an initial velocity described by uh, the vector seen here, 100 times 1 half comma 2 thirds comma the square root of 11 divided by 6 feet per second. 
And suppose we observe in a position at time t equal to zero described by uh, 0 comma 0 comma 10. Uh, that would be, excuse me. Oh! oh! I didn't have time to hit the pause button on that one. Feet. Right? These initial measurements for the projectile's motion at time t equal to 0 seconds. Right? These are going to be initial measurements of uh, velocity and uh, position, right? These are initial measurements of that projectile's motion, right? At time t equal to zero, right? So assume we have those observations. In this case, the future value for v bar of t, right? The future value function for v bar of t is given by this calculation here. It is v bar of zero added to the integral from zero to t for a bar of u to u. And since, uh, oh, we went with, yeah, we're, we're going with feet, and we might consider that we're observing this on Earth, uh, our description of acceleration, a bar of u, would be described by 0, 0, 0, negative 32, right? And so v bar of t would be our velocity observation plus the integral from 0 to t for that constant vector 0 comma 0 comma negative 32 integrated with respect to u and that's going to leave us to the result of you know the antiderivative of that vector which the antiderivative of 0 is still 0 but the antiderivative of negative 32 is negative 32 u and we're going to have to evaluate this antiderivative vector for this seen above across those bounds from 0 to t at 0, at all zeros, but at t, we produce 0, 0, comma negative 32t, that t coming back in to our functional description. And if I add up these three vectors in a little vector arithmetic, I end up with the result 50, comma 200 thirds, comma 50 root 11 thirds minus 32t. All right? So the des description of the projectile's velocity given this information about its initial velocity is this a velocity vector seen here and with this velocity vector seen here and our observed po initial position we can actually come up with a description using future value uh, for our position function as we've done in the previous example so let's roll through another case of that as for the object's description of position, r bar of t, similarly from the future value calculation, r bar of t would be r bar of 0 plus the integral from 0 to t for v bar of u du. v bar of t is this statement here, so in terms of u, that produces this result here. We aren't going to integrate from 0 to t. Where I get this lower bound from is this is my observed value of time and this result for uh, my observed position. The same went for velocity. right? And since my observed position is 0, 0, 10, I substitute that in here. And now I'm left with finding this antiderivative, which is 50 u, 200 thirds u, uh, 50 root 11 thirds u minus 16 u squared. All right, a little quick integration will get us to that result. Fundamental rules, nothing tricky here, folks. At least not in the notes to explain this away. Right, so it is going to be... Um, this vector here for r bar of 0 added to the antiderivative vector evaluated across these bounds. And at 0, again, it does 0 away. So we're really interested in its value at t, which we see given here. And if we perform this vector arithmetic, this becomes our position vector. All right. So overall, we have a position, velocity, and acceleration description here. Thus, the description of projectile's position is given by this, our bar of t vector. Uh, the velocity and acceleration are also described as follows. And all of these fit that relationship where uh, v bar of t is r bar prime of t, and a bar of t is v bar prime of t or r bar double prime of t. And all of these fit our initial conditions where uh, v bar of zero was that initial velocity vector that we had given to us. And r bar of 0 was this initial position vector that was given to us. That vector 0 comma 0 comma 10. All right. Now with these three vectors, we can start to answer questions regarding 
a, a little bit of analysis of that motion, right? We might say here, furthermore, right? let me bring this into view. With this motion information folks seen here, um, I can answer these questions about the uh, motion of that object. We could consider finding the math, max height of the projectile, per, or we could consider finding uh, perhaps its speed at the moment it makes contact with Earth. Those are just a couple of questions we could ask. And it does involve analyzing uh, some different aspects of the object's motion. Right, uh, for max height, right, you kind of see that hinted to down here below. This occurs at time t, right, uh, where the z component of that time t, uh, the z component of our velocity function v at t equals zero. Uh, if we go above here, here is our velocity function. When it's a Z component, this third component equals zero is when we have our max height occur. The, there's no more um, what we might say is a rate of change in the vertical direction and it equals zero, right? Uh, when that change is neither positive or negative in that direction, when it equals zero is when we reach max height. So down here we set that linear equation equal to zero and solve for t right subtract and divide all right and we will see here that or multiply by the reciprocal and we do see that t simplifies to what 25 root 11 divided by 48 units in measurement in, in seconds all right indicating that is the exact time right of max height all right implying that if we substitute that into the z component of position right it is given by the z component of r bar well we might say here yeah the z component of r bar at 25 root 11 40 comma four uh, divided by 48 right um and that value then is given going to be given by then the max height here if we take this point in time and we substitute it into this z component of position right for the unit of time we will get that description of the max vertical height of this projectile all right substituting that in to our calculation everywhere we see t yields this where i did substitute this into mathematica to perform the calculation folks for us just to go without air uh, but we get 8,315 divided by 144 and values what that simplifies to exactly or about 57.7431 feet as a measurement of max height all right furthermore for speed of impact speed at impact what's the speed when it makes when the object lands back on the ground right uh, this occurs at time t when the z component of our position function r bar at t is zero feet in value right and is given by uh, v bar at t at this time of impact all right uh, it's going to occur at the point in time when this z component of position equals zero and it's going to be given by the magnitude of v bar at that moment in time All right so we are going to have to set that equal to zero and solve All right now likely that's not going to factor for us here folks uh, so you might have to rely on a little quad formula i did run mine through mathematica in a solve process uh, and I might show you how to do that solve process here in a demo. I, I probably should. But if we solve that out exactly, this is what it is exactly. Uh, and in terms of an approximate value, it's about 3.62713 seconds is that time of a flight 
is what we might say. This is the time of flight from initial time to landing. This is our time of flight. And you find it by taking your Z component of position and setting it equal to zero. Technically, there's two solutions here, but one of them is negative and we don't consider position before time t equal to zero, only post time t equal to zero. So if we now take that point in time, I'm going to take the exact value here, plug it into my velocity function, and find its magnitude. Right? That's going to give me the speed at that moment in time. And that's what I have going on down here. Again, I think I ran this through Mathematica. Uh, that velocity function right, is going to be described at that moment in time will be described by this function seen or this value seen here. This is a, a scalar or a, a constant vector value. Right. Um, and we're going to be interested in its magnitude. If we simplify some of that more specifically, it's this simplified where then the magnitude is just given by the square root of the sum of these components being squared. And we see that happening here in the calculation. Uh, I think that's the point. I, I, well, I ran a few of these stages through Mathematica along the way. And I do get 4 root 665, which means um, if we simplify that, that is the velocity at impact. That is, well, careful there, that is the speed at impact. Uh, and the speed at impact is 103.15 feet per second in its description. All right. So, folks, that is a couple of uh, motion in space problems, uh, motion in n-dimensional space problems, where we make use of future value in the calculation. Um, and then, uh, certainly, specifically, this was an, an example of a projectile motion problem. Uh, projectile motion problems all start the same. They all start with the exact same acceleration vector. All right. And uh, projectile motion problems, you're going to have to have a little bit of information about some velocity, observed velocity, and some observed position. And if you know a little bit about some observed velocity and some observed position, with those bits of information, uh, you can develop these descriptions of velocity and uh, position that you can use to, to perform an analysis of that motion, folks. All right, so that's what we see happening here in uh, these examples. All right, uh, but with that said, I will stop that video for the night. That was a little shorter than I had expected, but it was just really uh, a couple of quick examples built on old ideas. Um, I did skim through some of the integrals there, but they were rather fundamental integrals and their rules. Um, Again, it's more of the concepts of this section that we make sure that we are uh, studying here, folks. But it is getting late. Um, I'm going to stop there for the night. I hope you're all doing well uh, and studying up. And I should see you folks in class very soon. So uh, with that said, I will uh, close down for the night. Have a good one. See you then.